All right, without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our speaker for this evening, Dr. Dan Carter. So I got to know Dan when we were both grad students together at Kansas State University. Um, at that point, Dan had already immersed himself in, in ecological restoration and native plant landscaping for uh, probably well over a decade. Um, while he was in grad school, his research looked at fundamental questions for prairie restoration. Things like how does a prairie that you plant or reestablish try to, or how does it change over time? Um, does it matter where you get the seed from? Really critical questions, not just for the science, but for the folks who want to get things done on the ground. Um, his native plant landscape interests are diverse and innovative, uh, pushing the boundaries of how we can integrate native plants into our home landscapes. Dan's currently the Landowner Services Coordinator for the Prairie Enthusiasts, a conservation nonprofit that protects fire dependent ecosystems in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Illinois. He's also a research associate and a former research fellow with the Milwaukee Public Museum and the owner of Dropseed Ecological and Botanical Services. He's also um, lead author of several scholarly articles in botanical and ecological journals. So it's our uh, our pleasure to welcome Dan tonight. He's over in Wisconsin, so I guess one of the uh, upsides of having to meet virtually is that we can bring folks in from anywhere. So join me in welcoming Dan this evening. Drop a comment in the comment box um, to help me give or help give me a, help give Dan a warm welcome. And um, I'm going to try and switch the presenter mode over to Dan while you guys drop a comment to welcome him. Hopefully that will go well. <laughs> Hello, right. everyone, and uh, thank you, Ben, and, and thanks for everyone for joining us. Um, uh, yeah, it's nice to um, get out of state, if not any other way, virtually, because that's not happening a lot these days. Um, I'm filming down in our uh, children's rumpus room, so uh, I'll pardon pardon me in advance for any. Um, dog barking or thumping around that might happen upstairs at some point but um that's just reality <laughs> um kids are at home let's see i'm sort of navigating here to share my screen so just one moment while i get this hopefully working um do, 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 do. Get my trying to get her into presentation mode. Okay. Um, I think there's going to be a little bit of a delay in my images coming through because what I'm seeing on my GoToMeeting screen is a little bit behind my clicks. So I went ahead and I went back. So um, it'll be a little bit tricky. I'll be trying to um, compensate for that here as I talk. Um, so yeah, as, uh, as Ben mentioned, um, I'm going to be talking about other things you can do with your lot, with your yard, with your landscape. Um, I'm trying to be a little bit provocative, provocative by saying that lawns are boring, but I think they really are. Um, looking to next slide and waiting. Um, I am going to make one plug. Uh, the Prairie Enthusiasts, um, my employer, is holding a conference later this month, and uh, it's an online conference, and the topics all have to do um, with prairies and other fire-dependent ecosystems, uh, restoration practice, and science. Um, and there's an art exhibition. Um, so if anybody's just interested in those sorts of topics in general, that's something you might check out. And if that slide will ever show up, um, then uh, then there's actually a, an image for that. That's where I was a second ago. I'm worried about trying again because I'm worried I'll skip ahead two slides. Hmm. Give it one second. If this gets really bad, um, I could potentially switch networks, but uh, 
this is the more reliable but slower network. Got it loaded up on my computer too, Dan, if you wanna pick it up. Yeah, we might just need to make this tra that transition. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, because otherwise it's going to be waiting 10 seconds between slides. It'll be easier for me to say next. So, okay. DSL, everyone. <laughs> Let's see. Did that show the right screen or was it still no? Uh well you'll have to get it into presentation mode, but you're just about there. Still not. All right, hold on just a minute. Yeah, yeah. So you can advance to the next slide because that's my sort of plug, the Prairie Enthusiasts Conference. So February twenty fourth through twenty seventh, um, and you can look at uh, the conference agenda and um, you know the keynotes right. and the different seminar speakers at the prairieenthusiastsorg slash conference. We can go to the next slide. So um, I'm talking about gardening today, but I'm a restoration ecologist. That's my day job. Uh, so what I do now is I perform um, outreach to landowners in the Prairie Enthusiasts operating area of parts of Minnesota, um, a good chunk of Wisconsin and Northwestern Illinois. So I go visit people's properties and walk and talk with them, get to see a lot of cool stuff. Uh, try to identify um, good conservation opportunities, um, connect people with resources um, to help fund uh, management or capacity for management, things like prescribed burning, um, right management plans for people, all those sorts of things. Um, it's a lot of fun for me because it's amazing how much there still is on the landscape. Um, so sometimes, um, it can be pretty depressing how degraded a lot of the landscape is, but um, quite a few landowners still have properties with remnant prairies and oak savannas and sedge meadows, um, new occurrences of rare species, those sorts of things. Next slide. Um, prior to that, in southeastern Wisconsin, um, I worked for a local um, or a regional planning agency doing natural areas planning. So doing assessments and conservation planning prioritization for different natural community types like um, this dry prairie in the county I live in, um, oak woodlands, savannas, swamps, all sorts of things, calcareous fens. Um, so that's what I do and have done recently. Next slide. Um, but I've also liked gardening for a long time. Um, as Ben mentioned, um, I was doing that when um, we were office mates and, uh, and, and next door neighbors um, in Manhattan, Kansas. Down there, I could grow a mean row of sweet potatoes, like a couple hundred pounds of sweet potatoes um, in a row like that. Um, so I like to vegetable garden. I've been gardening with all sorts of ornamental plants going back to when I was in elementary school, probably. Um, but when I was in high school, I discovered prairies. So I grew up in Iowa. In high school, early high school, I started going for long bike rides in the country. Um, maybe it's just sort of the, the stress of being a, a teenage human being. Um, but I found um, remnant prairie preserves, and I found them compelling. So I just started wanting to know everything I could about them. And um, that followed me home and that followed me into gardening and, and landscaping and transitioning that over to uh, using native plants. Uh, next slide. So I'm talking about alternatives to lawns. And so we'll have some 
general definitions here. So when I'm talking about these boring lawns, I'm talking about conventional lawns. And those are what a lot of us would imagine, um, exotic cool season grasses managed intensively, not to have a lot of weeds in them, um, you know, not even, you know, a dandelion permitted. And I chose a photograph of what I think is the most ridiculous conventional lawn ever, this lawn in, um, in a parking lot um, near where I live. Um, I could have had a picture of a big, you know, four acre lawn, um, but maintaining this as lawn just makes no sense to me. Uh, next slide. Um, a lawn alternative is just that, it's anything. It's anything other than that exotic cool season turf grass. It could be a native garden, it could be a vegetable garden, it could be an, a lawn like a turf consisting of native species. Um, and sort of an earlier iteration of this talk, and it's sort of one of my sort of nerdy sub-interests with gardening with native plants, um, had to do exclusively with developing actual turf lawns of North American species that you could walk on and recreate on and stuff. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in species that are good for that, but this talk has really sort of broadened out the larger topic of covering ground um, with native plants, appropriate plants, depending on how you use your space. Next slide. So there's a, there's a picture of what um, an alternative, a lawn alternative that is native North American species might look like. Um, I use native sedges, native uh, grasses in the genus Budalua. Uh, one of them is buffalo grass, which is native uh, farther west, especially um, for Michigan. Uh, poverty oak grass, a number of low growing native wildflowers, especially early blooming ones. And I mow that and you know that's where the dog and the kids play. It's where we can put a sprinkler out. It's where we can put the kids little kiddie pool out and those sorts of things. So the full range, next slide. So why? Well, there's a lot of turf grass out there. I'm sure you're aware. I live in sort of suburbia around Milwaukee um, and um, a number of you I'm sure live in sort of the equivalent. There's a lot of lawn, there's a lot of turf grass out there. And this is getting kind of dated. This is um, based on an assessment that was done back in 2005 and um, national parks designations and things have changed since then. But, you know, there's more turf grass out there, at least estimated turf, turf grass than, than national park lands. Next slide. So, you know, there's a lot of turf grass. Why is that bad? Well, um, it doesn't support a lot of biodiversity. Um, it supports just a few plant species, those exotic grasses that we choose. Um, and even if we let it get weedy, which is better, um, it doesn't support a lot of specialist insects. So native plant species tend to support specialist and general generalist insects. And even the generalist insects, on average, on balance, tend to do better um, with native vegetation than exotic vegetation. All right, so I think that's a pretty good reason. Um, I also, I don't know, I love plants and I love biodiversity. And I also just think these things have intrinsic value. Um, there's a lot that we don't understand about them. Um, there's, there's a lot of value they could have that, that maybe someday we'll discover, but I think just in and of themselves, um, they're good to have around. And a lot of these elements of our native biodiversity, our native flora in particular, um, are in decline or have already declined dramatically on the landscape, especially the species that are associated with prairies and savannas, which are some of the best species to use and some of the species I'm gonna be talking about. Those species, just their historic declines are um, oftentimes greater than 90, 95, 99%. Um, and if, you know, if, they were, if they were eagles or if they were uh, other charismatic um, organisms, um, it, there might be more of an outcry. Um, the pictures there are um, a giant swallowtail, um, 
caterpillar on hop tree, Telia. Um, they look like bird, bird poop. They're pretty cool, but they're specialists on plants in the citrus family or the rue family. On the right, there's an American lady butterfly in my native turf laying her eggs in April on field cat's foot or, or pussy toes, Antonaria. Next slide. So these, commercial, these conventional lawns are generally resource intensive. They take work to maintain. Like I said, I think they're boring. Also, the way we deploy them in, the, in and around where we live separates us from nature. And also the way we typically garden separates us from nature. So the picture on the right is sort of the prevailing paradigm of how we garden. We've got turf or we've got lawn. It's a space where maybe we could walk around. We've got flower beds. So there's sort of this lawn bed paradigm. And I don't like that. Um, I think that is limiting. Next slide. I want this. So uh, these are, are my kids that might disturb the talk at some point um, in the front yard. So, you know, people worry about where are the kids going to play? Well, they're going to play in your alternative. They don't need turf grass to be happy. They're, they're finding all sorts of cool stuff out there. It doesn't all have to be tall stuff. There can be stuff that's shorter places where you do certain things. But um, I want... I want those transitions to be blurred. I personally want to mill about and walk around and not have boundaries that, that I'm trying to adhere to. And I want the same for my children when they're out playing in the yard. Next slide. So just some examples, you know, prairie drop seed makes a good bean bag. Um, you know, we have wildlife and, and we can find it and explore that. So. Um, there we are with just a, that's just a common guard, garter snake. Next slide. Uh, a potter wasp on rough drop seed. A bumblebee mimic robber fly that came down out of a, a birch tree in our yard and landed on my wife. And at first was, was a bit of a, a start, but it was consuming a Japanese beetle. Pretty cool. Um, but these are the sorts of things that you run into when you start to remove those boundaries and you can actually get out in it. Um, and also just a little bit of a tangent, um, you know, converting more of your land, um, more of your lot to native vegetation and reducing or eliminating um, pesticide inputs into it will allow you, your, your little patch of land to support predator, predatory insects. And so when there are um, outbreaks of things like Japanese beetles, there are things that can start to respond and eat them. Next slide. Just another example of this, these are wasps um, that have just hatched out um, and they're gathering on Plains Coreopsis, another one that's native more west of you in Michigan, but uh, these parasitize the grubs of Japanese beetles. So just illustrating that, you know, side benefit of a lot of biocontrol going on here. Next slide tree frogs. Um, it's hard for us to go for a walk in the yard without seeing a tree frog. And that's pretty cool for the kids. I have to be careful when I'm gardening that I don't sit on them and, and things like that. But um, uh, yeah, next slide. So how to plan this? And what's really important is that you understand how you use space or how you want to use space where you live. So this is an aerial image of our lot on our street um, that dates back to about when we bought our house and, and what was there. And what's identified here are the areas that seem like they would get different levels of use. So we have an area off a deck in the back. That's where we spend a lot of time. It gets walked on all the time. So I wanted to maintain that as turf and I have subsequently converted that to native turf. Then in yellow are areas that they get passed through, but they don't really get intensive human use. And then there are areas in green. And in our yard, our front yard slopes down to the street. Um, in the far back, it just gets farther away from the house. Those areas aren't used very much. They're unused areas. Um, I've actually 
found that they're less unused now that I've, I've converted them because they're appealing. Um, but those are the sorts of areas that if they were um, conventional turf grass lawn, um, a, a good way to sort of assess this is if you're out mowing the yard, if the last time you were there was last time you were mowing the yard, then it's pretty much an unused area. And it makes no sense for that to be conventional turf grass. You're just basically main, maintaining that and that's its only use and it's only taking your time um, with the lawn mowing. So those are the sorts of areas where um, you're visiting them really very rarely, especially if they're in bluegrass or fescue. Next slide. So those heavily used areas are reserved for lawn. And, um, you know, it's fine to have some conventional lawn. I think it's good to minimize it. Um, it's even better to have some conventional lawn and let it get a little bit weedy um, with things like dandelions and clover, because then at least you have some resources for pollinators and you're not putting a lot of inputs into your turf. Um, the best thing you can do, and this is harder, but this is a frontier you can strive for and get to, is replace that with native species that have ecological interactions with other flora and fauna where you live locally, just to create a much more dynamic system. So this picture, um, this is an area of poverty oak, oak grass, Danthonia, which is a, an oak woodland, a dry forest oak savanna grass um, with, with some native sedges mixed in, just common wood sedge. You can see in the picture some of the broader leaves. And those big leaves um, are native where I live, probably not out your way, but kittentails, which is a Midwest endemic dry prairie savanna plant. I have a sandy loam soil, so it does very well for me. And it has flat a flat rosette growth form, so it'll tolerate um, foot traffic. Uh, next slide, or next animation. So the lightly to moderately used areas, you plant with just low vegetation, but maybe not lawn level low vegetation. So here's a fall view of an area along the side of our house. There's a bunch of different sedges and woodland grasses and wildflowers there. Um, they tend to stay shorter. Some of them are taller um, during the season of their bloom, but before that and after that, they're, they're generally short growing plants. And so that's an area you can just walk through and it doesn't have much of a negative impact on it if you just don't walk on the same path every time. I do have a meandering sort of wood, wood trip, wood chip footpath off to the side, but a lot of times we just walk off to the side through the grasses and sedges. Uh, next. And then the unused areas, that's where you can put the tall stuff, but oftentimes that's really pretty stuff and really interesting stuff. Um, next. So this is how this all looks next to each other. So I talked about not liking that lawn and bed sort of paradigm or way of gardening. So back behind our house where that red dot is, we have mowed turf. In this case, it's native turf, or it wouldn't but it wouldn't have to be. Um, but then that just transitions into mid-height stuff. And then that just sort of gradually transitions into taller stuff over to the right. And actually coming towards me in the foreground, it's getting shorter again. That's all um, field cat's foot and robin's plantain that except when it blooms is very short. Um, and that'll get mowed down again later too. One of the benefits of the turf, the heavily used area being native stuff, is it's easier to have that gradual transition to taller stuff. You don't have to worry about something like bluegrass spreading out into stuff you don't want it getting into. Um, you know, the shorter stuff I have there doesn't tend to do that. It just kind of grows under the taller stuff gradually that's next to it and, and not out over the top of it or up through it. Uh, next, <laughs> I just tried to advance my own slide. Um, and I could probably spend a lot more time on this topic, um, but I'm really just gonna treat it briefly. You need to understand where you are in terms of the physical conditions on your property. So this is Google Street View of where I live before we moved in. This is what it looked like to start. So you're gonna see pictures down the road of how this changed. 
Um, but you need to understand your oh, you need to understand your soil characteristics. So obviously sandy versus clay. I I apologize to you if you have clay soils because this is harder to do. Um, everything's harder to do with gardening if you have clay soils, but there are still things you can do. Um, drainage, and that oftentimes goes along with sand versus clay, but maybe you have a layer, you have sandy soil over a clay layer where you have sandy soils at the surface, but still have poor drainage. Um, soil richness in history. So there was a comment about this initially in the chat, and, and it might get mentioned again later, but um, you know, is your house built somewhere where soils were moved around and regraded? Do you basically have low organic matter mineral soil that's exposed or not? Was there a barnyard near where your house is or where your house is? Is it really rich? Are there a lot of nutrients? Um, because that ha that affects how this plays out. And it's easier the, the poorer your soil is actually, because it minimizes the weed problems and um, native plants tend to do fine, even if your soil is really poor. Um, and, and light conditions, obviously. But um, think about that in all seasons uh, as well. Um, next. And there's a couple of questions in the chat about uh, neighbors and how you deal with that. Uh, is there anything that you do for your planning that involves um, thinking about your neighbors or working with your neighbors? <laughs> I'm an introvert. Um, yeah, so that's a good question. And that's a question I get a lot and it, it, it can get kind of broad, but um, so I radically changed our yard and there's no turf out front and that's a big change. And I have borders with neighbors on both sides. What I've done with those borders with my neighbors is I, I have a lot of uh, native shrubs um, and not other taller things, but but basically a, a good mix of native shrubs. And that's the one place where I use mulch. So mulch along the property line, native shrubs, my side of the native shrubs, lots of native plants, neighbor side of the native shrubs where that mulch meets their turf. I have a tool I'll, I'll show you later on, but I have a, a flame torch that I just, I walk and maintain that line every couple of weeks during the summer um, with a propane torch. Um, so, and actually I've, I've never had anything but compliments from my neighbors. They think it looks like it's very complex and difficult relative to their turf, but, um, and I'll talk about more about this later, but I spend less time on it. Um, I've actually had no complaints and I probably had half the people on my street at this point, half the households on my street, um, um, give positive feedback so um, that's but that's one of the critical things it's important when you do this um, to do it in a thought out way and methodical way with a lot of attention to detail and where you're putting different plants and make sure the plants are appropriate um, because how things look and how things turn out are really important for people's perceptions so you can have a really diverse native landscape or native landscaping in your yard that is very ecologically vibrant, um, but which sets off everybody's weed alarm bells. Um, but you can have the same thing and laid out in a way that people just think you've got a really pretty flower garden all over your whole front yard. And they say, wow, I really like your flowers. I think a lot of the people that have given compliments don't even know that they're native plants at least at the outset at least until we start talking about it um all right let's move along cool, thanks yeah there's one more and probably you'll get to this later but uh suggestions for planting under a pine tree so if you want to bookmark that and come back to it later i can try i might just say so, so um there are a lot of tricky specific um uh, situations that's sort of this dry oftentimes a dry shady situation um, very shady situation um, one plant that might work well um, is is barren strawberry which is a plant that I'll I'll get to I'll talk about some specific plants barren strawberry is um, taxonomically a bunch of different things um, 
it's a GM, it's a Waldsteinia, um, but but we'll get to that. Um, I suppose we can go to the next slide. So understanding your property well and and what you could do a a great thing to do is to try to understand what nature does under similar circumstances in terms of light and soil and in terms of natural communities around where you live. Um, part of why we bought, bought our house is that we had some, there were some nice older um, oak trees there, um, bur oak trees, not white oak trees like in this woodland picture, but um, understanding how plants interact with one another, what they look like and what that might mean for your landscape. Um, and that's part of why it's really critical to have um, well-stewarded, well-protected uh, remnant natural communities, um, not just for their own sake, but they, they help us understand how we might model them in, in our restoration projects, whether those be large-scale ones or they just be your yard. So one of my inspirational sites is this Oak Woodland, which is near where I live. Uh, about half of the photograph now is, is paved over, unfortunately because it was bought by the state to put in a boat launch. Um, and, and then over on the left is what, what the ground layer vegetation looks like. And if you're a plant nerd, you might see yellow star grass and wood betony and robin's plantain, and there's wood rush and blue eyed grass and dry spike sedge and Pennsylvania sedge. But these are all things that are growing low and together well. And they're all part of the vegetation that's making that park-like setting. And what nicer thing could you have in your yard, especially in the places that you're not walking on all the time? Um, so I like to draw heavily on places like that and um, understanding how they're put together. And um, I mean, that's that's part of the advantage I get from, I guess, being a, a restoration ecologist coming at gardening. But I think anybody um, can learn a lot from the natural communities around where they live. I think um, just visiting places and walking and talking in them with the people that manage them and know most about them is where I've learned most of what I know. I'm, it's not from school. Uh, next slide. Um, preparation. So um, <laughs> this is something I don't do anymore. So this is back in Kansas um, and I don't have a great picture of it. Um, you, if you're going to put in native vegetation, whether it be a native turf or a native um, flower bed, even though I don't like to say flower bed, but just an area of native vegetation, um, you can dig out your turf. You can get a sod cutter. You can do what I did here and use a shovel to dig everything out. You have to have somewhere to put that material. Um, it creates a fair amount of disturbance. You also have to consider potential erosion issues. And it's a lot of work. Um, I don't know that my back would put up with that anymore, but that's one way of preparing. You need to prepare a weed free uh, space. So you need to eliminate the existing turf and you need to minimize other weeds. And one way to do that is just to dig it up. Next. Um, you can smother it. Um, I've used this approach before as well. Um, depending on what you have, it takes different amounts of time. If you have uh, a lot of dandelions that you want to kill because you want to replace them with native flowers, if you have quack grass, um, those things take a long time to kill by smothering, um, by putting down cardboard or opaque material to kill them. Um, more than a full growing season. So a, a full growing season and maybe a few months into the next one is what it really takes to kill those. You can kill pure bluegrass um, more quickly, especially if you get it out early in the season. Um, so that's fairly effective. Um, you have to have the materials to do that. Um, there can also be erosion issues with that because you're creating some impervious surface and rain tends to go down into the seams. So you can create erosion issues underneath if you do this in the wrong place or if you're not careful. Next. Or you can spray your turf grass. And um, you know, ideally this is something that you do judiciously. And if you do this right, you do it once and then you never do it again. So this is the the front yard in progress and what i've done is i've there it's still still going with with turf it's mostly fescue in the middle 
and I'm working in from the outside and I'm spraying it and killing it and moving native vegetation into that area. Um, I, I have the comment on the top of this slide, consider doing a little bit at a time. Um, that's what can make it manageable, but that's also what can save you a lot of money on plants. Um, so I started with some critical areas um, and with some plants I knew I would want more of and was able to, you know, expand outward from there by dividing plants, um, uh, digging up seedlings, spontaneous seedlings from plants that started to self-sow and moving them out into this area. So, you know, I, to start with, I ordered some flats of, of grasses like prairie drop seed and, and stuff, but um, thereafter, I was pretty much going with divisions and, and covering a lot of my plants. Um, I also start a lot of plants from seed inside, but well, we'll get to that. Uh, next slide. And I finally got to killing that turf grass. And why this area in particular was a good candidate to just spray uh, was that it's on that steep front slope. Um, and when you spray turf, the dead turf remains in place and its roots remain in place for a while. So if you're going to plant into that, it gives you time to get plants established uh, before those roots in that in the above ground material decomposes and leaves the soil exposed. So in that sense, it's it's superior to removing the turf and leaving and creating bare soil. Um, and it's also better than smothering the turf um, where water is going to run down between the seams and and, and goalie, create goalies underneath um, the smothering material. Um, but this only needed to happen once. Um, as soon as the grass was dead, it was ready to plant native plants into. Uh, next. And uh, so this is one year later, that same area. Um, covered with native plants, sort of developing. This is sort of late spring. You can see Canada anemone. It's moist down near the street. It's very dry above it. Otherwise, it would spread up and be a problem. Um, and earlier spring stuff. Um, next slide. And this is two years later, but a little later in the spring. Um, next. And fall. Um, so you can really establish native vegetation very quickly um, if you want. And, but that was just prepared by um, spraying the turf, ensuring that it was completely dead. Um, I'll talk more about methods for planting, but in that case, I had mostly um, put out transplants. Uh, next. So should you seed or should you use transplants? I've done both, um, and there are reasons to do both, and I'll highlight some of those. And um, those are two areas of the uh, native turf that I have in the backyard. I did some from transplants. I did some from seeding. Um, buffalo grass is very difficult to establish from seed, but I did that in an area just because I was short on transplants and I wanted to cover that area. Um, but you can see on the left-hand side, there are a lot of weeds coming up. Um, it's more difficult to control those. Uh, next slide. So transplants, um, sort of the pros or reasons to do it that way. Um, early on, if you've put out transplants and space them, it's a lot easier to keep tracks of weeds and weeding, especially if you're not great on the identification of really little itty bitty seedling weeds right when they come up and differentiating those from native plants. Um, it takes less preparation. Um, it depends on what you're seeding, but some seeds like the buffalo grass require a good, well-prepared, loose seed bed. Um, other things you can just plant and fall on top of dead turf and it'll work. But when you're putting in transplants, you just dig a hole and put them in. Um, of course, they establish faster. So an area like you see planted on the right, that's springtime. By fall, that's going to be full. It's going to be a full area of native vegetation that's filled in enough that there's very little weed problem anymore because there's just no space. Um, you can transplant things any time of year that the ground's not frozen, basically. If you're doing it in the summer, you just want to um, be mindful of how hot and sunny it is. It works better to do it in the evening or when the next day is going to be cloudy or rainy. 
I usually uh, cut off the top two thirds of the above ground parts of plants that I'm transplanting during the hot time of year. Well, really most times of year, that's just my general practice. Um, it hurts to do it, but the plants do a lot better. Um, there's less danger of erosion if you're not preparing a loose seed bed, if you're just putting in the transplants and they're filling in quickly. And the, um, there are a lot of species that are difficult to propagate from seed uh, quickly, but they are very easy to spread out and multiply vegetatively. Um, and I'll show you some of those. Um, but you can really expand your footprint quickly by, by division. And um, some of the best species for sort of being filler um, are propagated that way. Um, it's more expensive initially, especially early on if you make an initial purchase of plants, even if you're dividing them later. Um, but I can tell you that at this point, I've done our whole lot and sort of an unlegally defined area next to it that I've sort of commandeered. It's about eight tenths of an acre, and um, you know, on on herbaceous plants, I don't think I've gotten much into um, four figures of plants, and I've done that whole area and a lot of it through transplants. Um, next slide. So about the spacing, and this is really a critical thing, and this is actually the critical method. The slide looks pretty dull, but it's it's a critical slide. So there are certain plants that make really good sort of living mulch or filler or matrix, native grasses and sedges. There are some different wildflowers that are spreading that, that work really well. Um, you space those 12 to 18 inches apart, and um, it doesn't hurt to err on the lower side, like closer to 12 inches. Um, the closer they are, the faster things will fill in. Um, and then you sort of, other elements of biodiversity you, you want, other wildflowers you want. You just, you stick between those matrix plants, those grasses, those sedges, those spreading wildflowers. Um, so you might have native grasses like prairie drop seed or little blue stem, and then you're throwing in butterfly milkweed and um, and Ohio spiderwort and, and nodding wild onion in between them. Uh, next slide. Uh, seeding. Um, there are more species available. Um, and if you're like me, um, nerdy and wanting to have a lot of species, you're going to do some seeding because that's the only way you're going to get them going. Um, so there are species that are just available commercially that way. Um, there's less labor initially if you're seeding and you're just throwing out seed, that, that is once you have a seed bed prepared. Uh, seed generally costs less per unit area than transplants. And you can certainly use seed to generate plants if you're good at growing things out. Um, but you have that additional seed bed um, preparation with that the associated erosion risk. And weeding is a lot more difficult, especially if seeding is what you're relying on. You really need to be good at knowing what plants are when they're young. And the timing matters more. There are things that are best seeded in fall or winter, so they have a cool period. There are things that are best seeded in spring, like the buffalo grass is best seeded in May. Um, so the timing matters more, and it's, it's a little bit less forgiving. Um, the plant that is shown there is wood betony. It's a partially parasitic native plant, it's a really good resource for native bees. It occurs in prairies, savannas, oak woodlands, dry forests. Um, it's best to stay, it's, it's not available widely commercially as plants. If you want it, you have to plant it from seed and probably fresh seed. It's also a very valuable plant for a plant community. Um, it's been shown to help prevent aggressive native plants from becoming over dominant because it disproportionately parasitizes them. It's sort of evens the playing field in the community um, so that more species can coexist. Um, next slide. Sources. So this is just really a incomplete list, especially probably for you in Michigan. And I'm not gardening in Michigan, so I'm not as aware of sources. So um, Ben mentioned a native plant sale. That's a great source of plants. Um, 
there are a couple of nurseries there um, in Michigan too that that I am aware of, like Hidden Savannah and Wild Type Native Plant Nursery. Um, a lot of my plants have come from nurseries in Minnesota, actually, just because they produce very nice plants or species I like. Blazing Star Gardens produces the, a number of those partially parasitic plants like wood betony um, and hoary pecoon and, and other interesting things like that. Eisel native plants sort of is a aggregator of wholesale vendors of native plants that allows you to buy them retail and you put in your zip code and um, nurseries generally that are in your region, but you have to keep an eye out because some of them aren't. Um, you get you can look at their inventory. Um, I use a lot from Prairie Moon Nursery and Morning Sky Greenery, but but generally those are those are some good sources I'm aware of the transplants or plugs or seeds or all of those. Next slide. Dan, we got a couple of questions. If this is a good spot. Um, so one a couple about what chemical you're using for for spring um and then one about how often you mow and how or when you mow and how much maybe that's for later and then recommendations for under a walnut tree <laughs> okay so um the spraying is glyphosate so i a lot of people are uncomfortable with that and they're all uh, there are alternative methods if you're not comfortable with that um, but that's what i use because it's effective and it's not um, long-term residual in the soil and it allows me to plant and establish native vegetation very quickly um, and and it, it works really well on on turf grass species um, so you know um, there aren't a lot of at least as far as I'm aware, good alternatives to that, or at least any that are, um, you know, more environmentally friendly. Um, but the idea is um, to have the sequence of work you're doing such that you're applying at one time and, and transitioning to native vegetation and not needing to do it again. Um, so, okay, so, was the next one under about the walnut tree or was there another one in the middle? Uh, yeah, there's the walnut tree one and then the other one might be for later about mowing. Over okay, turf so areas. Yep. Um, uh, I'll talk about that a little more, but my turf grass area, it's, it's about how much you wanna do it. I mow it every couple of weeks um, just because when it gets a little bit tall, it tends to be really dewy and I have the kids out and everybody gets all wet for half the morning all summer long. Um, so I mow that every couple of weeks. I could mow it once a month and it would be fine. You need to mow it at least once a month, otherwise the taller stuff starts to colonize it. And um, so you'll, it'll be colonized by, you know, nice asters and stuff that you've planted in the surrounding area or blazing stars and stuff if you don't if you don't mow it more often than that and then the areas that aren't are sort of intermediate they get mowed one two three times during the year sometimes after things bloom and disperse their seeds i i mow them off and then maybe i'll do it again in the fall it depends on how i'm using space you can mow to just expand your intensively used space temporarily under walnut trees, a lot of native plants do well under walnut trees. And I can't off the top of my head give you a good list, but a lot of uh, floodplain forest um, species do well under walnuts because that's where walnuts historically were most prevalent. Um, so there are a lot of spring ephemerals and, um, and sedges and um, woodland grasses that will do fine under walnut trees. And that would be a good place to start. If so, if it's shady enough, you know, walnuts, one walnut by itself doesn't cast a lot of shade, but if it's shady enough, there are a lot of woodland plants that, that should do well. Wild geranium should do well, I think. Um, I'm thinking of the places that have been that just have a lot of walnut trees and what's growing. But, um, you know, wild ginger should do well under walnut. Um, uh, trout lilies should do well under walnut. That's truly ephemeral, so those will go dormant. But um, but yeah, so I'd look into into woodland species and and if you have places to go visit, if there's a uh, 
a forest along a river bottom, the, the upland portions of the, of the river bottom, the places that flood infrequently that really aren't wetland, if they're in good condition, those are good places to look for plants that do well under walnut. Uh, bladder pod is a shrub, Staphylaea, that does well under walnut. Um, it grows in that environment. It has cool little flowers and then its fruits are like these little balloons. Um, yeah, next slide. So this is being recorded, so you can come back to this. And this isn't in any particular order, but these are just some of my favorite species for filling space, um, because that's really the critical element. So those things that you space 12 to 18 inches apart and then put stuff in between. So um, I'll, I'll get into some of the details on how this is organized, and we're not gonna go through this chart, but you know, there are things like prairie drop seed and little blue stem for sunny, less used areas. There are things like, Sprangles sedge and Pennsylvania sedge and um, fox sedge. Fox sedge can be sunny or can be part shade. Um, some of those other sedges are for range of sun to full shade. Um, the things that I have highlighted in green are things that tolerate mowing and foot traffic relatively well. So buffalo grass is there. You need to have well-drained soil and a lot of sun for it. I do fine with it in Wisconsin, although the uh, the turf experts all say you can't grow buffalo grass in Wisconsin. I've had a buffalo grass lawn now for six years and it's great. And we've had crazy wetter than average weather. Um, poverty oak grass is a good grass. It needs good drainage too. This gets harder for you if you have clay soil, soil, soils. Although golden fruited sedge um, will do well with poor drainage if it's not too dry. Um, and then the rest of those are sort of ground covering low wildflowers. Um, that I'll be talking more about. Um, I have some asterisks down near the bottom. Those are things that you want to get other stuff going before you plant them because um, if you get them going first, they tend to be kind of aggressive. So order of planting matters more with those. Um, but you can come back to this, but, we'll, but I'll show you some examples here. So we can go to the next slide. So sedges. Um, and what doesn't really come through in the, these pictures, which are, are pretty early in spring, is that, you know, this is a good medium to mix spring ephemeral wildflowers into. So things like spring beauties, you know, if, you, if you're purchasing those, they, they cost a pretty penny, but they're worth getting established because they're nice native spring ephemeral wildflower that will slowly spread. So if you do the job of getting some of it established, you know, 30, 40 years down the road, maybe somebody will thank you. If they, if, they, if they don't just spray everything and start over. Um, but on the left, that's Sprangles sedge in the springtime. On the right, the bigger sedge you see there is Sprangles sedge, but there are probably 20 other woodland sedges there. Sprangles sedge is just one of the really nice ones. Um, if we go to the next slide, this is uh, looking back in, in the same general area, uh, the other direction, that's Pennsylvania sedge. It's beautiful early in the spring. Its male flowers are these nice um, sort of palm, bright yellow pom-poms. Um, they actually get visited by solitary native bees even when other things are blooming. Um, so there's some pollinator value to it as well. It makes a really good ground cover. If you have very sandy soil, it may be a little over aggressive. I have sandy loam. It's perfect. It's a great ground cover. It's great for planting other things into. Um, and it's, it's sort of a low statured sedge. Um, it'll tolerate being mowed once or twice. So it's good for the sort of those moderate use areas as well. Uh, next slide. Um, the sedges also support some specialists. So this is just um, my little guy with a Virginia tanuka moth caterpillar. Um, and there's the Virginia tanuka moth later, uh, but their host plant. Well, it's just sedges more broadly, but I think they seem to like Sprangles sedge, and then I had a lot of it on Hitchcock sedge, and there's some sedges they seem to prefer more than others, but um, I don't know that a lot is known on the specifics of their, their sedge preferences. Next slide. Um, prairie drop seed and little blue stem can just look beautiful. So these are nice, discrete bunch grasses. When they're not flowering, they're fairly low growing. They look deliberate. You're probably familiar with them from, you know, 
parking lots and, and other native plantings. They're really great for interspersing native flowers with. And now in this picture, you don't see a lot of other native flowers blooming, but they are in there. Um, little blue stem is sort of the, in the center, it looks a little more bluish or blue gray. Prairie drop seed is, is, is sort of a different shade of green. So they, they can look really nice grown in combination with one another. And a lot of people perceive these as drier prairie plants, um, but they'll tolerate a fair amount of moisture. They just don't like standing water. Um, a lot of the highest quality mesic, so sort of even moisture prairies or prairies that are wet early and dry out, or even some of the, as long as they're not wetland prairies are, are dominated by little blue stem and, and prairie drop seed. And even some of our calcareous fen wetlands are dominated by little blue stem. Um, as long as the water table is below their root zone. And so you can really grow them in a wide range of conditions and a wide range of soil types too. Um, next slide. Uh, these are some of the, several of the different um, wildflowers that make really good sort of space filling ground covers. So you don't see it, but there's a sidewalk just to the left and just, I wanted to have low stuff next to the sidewalk that goes to the front door. So. Front and close to us, those daisy-like flowers are, are robin's plantain, Erigeron pulchellus, it's in that table. It, um, its leaves make a really nice ground-hugging, fuzzy um, ground cover, very tolerant of dry shade, as long as it's not like maple shade, but under birch or oak, um, and potentially under pine if it's not too deep. Um, of shade, I'm, I'm not really sure, I haven't experimented with that. Behind that is prairie smoke. Um, it needs a little more light than Robin's plantain requires, but it still gets enough light under three quarters uh, paper birch shade like it is there. And it's also low growing, a little bit slower spreading. Um, a really good bumblebee plant early in the season. It's native mostly west of Michigan though. I don't know if you have um, native occurrences in Michigan or maybe they're in the UP. Um, it's a prairie plant extending west into the um, Rocky Mountain region. Um, further back, there's sort of a taller bright green plant and that is um, a northern bedstraw, Gallium boreala. Also a great ground cover. It's really great for plunking down um, somewhat taller mid and late season plants into. So later in the season in that area, there's going to be purple milkweed and showy goldenrod and things. Uh, uh, Ohio spider, spiderwort are going to come up through it. To the right, it's done blooming, but wood betony. Um, it's also very tolerant of a wide range of conditions, as long as it has host plants that it can tap into. Um, so here it's in sort of a, a dry part shade. Um, but it could be in full sun and it could be in uh, under a complete oak canopy or under a complete aspen canopy, but not maple. Uh, next slide. So thinking about putting these things together, so, you know, you want to have things that fill space. You want to have those matrix plants. Um, if your species will be able to share space better if you're filling that space with species that use space differently below ground. So some species root shallow, some root deep, some grow from bulbs, some have tap roots, some have corms, those sorts of things. And they fill time. And as a gardener, that's something you wanna do. You wanna have things that are interesting throughout the season. Um, it's not just flowering, but it's active growth. If you have things in a space actively growing throughout the growing season, um, not only is there going to be more going on ecologically, but you're going to have fewer weed problems because you're not having a bunch of spring stuff that then goes dormant. And then in the mids, in midsummer, you get a bunch of midsummer weeds or you're not having late stuff. And then early in the spring, you have a bunch of cool season weeds, those sorts of things. So you wanna fill time. And this is just a little bit of Remnant Music Prairie as inspiration for that. So it's just all filled with little sedges and, and wood betony early in the spring. But those things coming up are prairie blazing star and stiff sunflower and, um, and, and spider wart, bracted spiderwort and, and things that bloom later in the year and that grow actively later in the year. So there's this whole pro progression. Um, so that space is just really used in, in multiple dimensions of thinking of it. Uh, next slide. That's a good spot for a few more questions, Dan. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so I had one uh, just from the last slide. Is that gallium, uh, Jane asked, is that gallium the sticky gallium? Sorry? Is that the northern bed straw? Is that the uh, sticky, uh, the bed straw that sticks to your clothing? <laughs> no, no, it's a different one. It's a nicer one. Um, you're thinking of um, probably gallium aparini, but there's also gallium, um, uh, uh, is it, oh, I always get trifluorum and trif, it's trifluorum, I think. That one's also kind of sticky. Those are weedier ones. This one's a nice um, perennial gallium. It tends, at least where I live, it grows in nice uh, wet mesic to mesic prairies and fens, but also in oak woodlands and savannas in drier conditions. So if it's in part shade, it'll grow in a dry sort of part shade condition. Um, but it's a really nice plant. It's got nice flowers when it's blooming too. I like that it's pretty showy for a gallium. Mm -hmm. um, another another good, question, oh, oh, go ahead. I'm gonna interject another good gallium if you can find it somewhere is shining bed straw, gallium consinum. Um, it likes it maybe a little, it's more of a woodland dry forest specialist, um, but it has really attractive shiny foliage and it's sim similarly attractive in terms of its flowers. Go ahead. Uh, next question, uh, how much weeding do you need to do once things are established? I think we'll get to this later, so if you want to punt that one, we'll yeah, get back I'll to it. That. Yep. Okay. Um, how about, I think this has to do with establishing plants. How much rain do you get in Wisconsin where you're at and do you do supplemental watering? Um, well, okay. So we've had a lot of really wet years. So my climatology is about 34 inches of liquid equivalent precipitation a year. Um, more of that in the warm season, the cool season. I live in an area, we get some lake effect snow, but not as much as, as the lower peninsula of Michigan. Um, but we've had generally wet years and with only very short dry periods in summer. Um, when I transplant things, I do, I water things when I plant them. And if, if it's abnormally dry, maybe I'll supplementary water them. But um, I also tend to transplant things really with as much with as little root disturbance as possible so i transplant a lot of seedlings in big chunks of dirt with no root disturbance and if you move that seedling that way um so I, if i find a little butterfly milkweed seedling um and it's still small enough i can transplant it, it comes with a big chunk of dirt i plant it i water it in and uh, it should do just as well as it would have done if i wouldn't have moved it um, things that are seeded need a lot more work. So buffalo grass is an extremely drought tolerant grass, but if you establish it from seed, you have to keep the seed bed moist 24 seven until it starts growing and it takes three weeks or so. So you have to be around to water it in the middle, middle of the day for like three weeks um, to really do a good job with that one. Um, so it, it really varies, um, but I, I don't think I'm probably that different from, from you really. No, yeah, I think you're pretty close. Uh, another question, uh, I think this is about plant selection. And um, so what about deer and what about mosses? Do you like to use mosses and how do you cope with deer? Uh, deer are a problem for me. For some of you, I'm sure they're a problem. For some of you, I'm sure they're worse of a problem. In my neck of the woods, it ranges from common buckthorn can't even grow anymore, can't get going because the deer are so bad. Um, to about how it is where I am, where I certainly have to do some things. So as I was getting started, um, I had a lot of deer browse on, on plants, on flowers. Um, now that my whole lot is native plants, the deer pass through and I don't notice that much damage. There's not as much that I think sticks out to them that they zero in on. Same's true with rabbits. Um, I had a lot of rabbit damage early on, but once I got to like a critical spatial threshold, um, the rabbit damage um, wasn't that noticeable. Um, I do have a favorite product that doesn't pay me anything, but I will I will plug it. It's called Bobex, B-O-B-B-E-X. I use it on all of my woody stuff that I'm worried about deer browsing. I spray it all once every three weeks. 
You don't need to spray it extra if it rains. Um, I've never had anything browse that I had sprayed within three weeks. Um, new growth, of course, like in herbaceous plants can grow out of that. So it's, I, 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 it's probably best for woody stuff. I sprayed in the winter too, but um, it works really well. It's just one of those sticky sprays, but it seems to work really well for me. Um, but I have deer through my yard every night, probably like there's just a little cadre of four or five deer that come through every night. Uh, I probably live in an area where we have 40 per square mile. I'm aware there are places that have a lot more than that. Yeah, and then uh, moss, that was the other half of that one. Oh yeah, so um, I'm not a bryophyte expert. I like moss. One thing that happens if you're not using a lot of mulch in your garden, and if you don't have excessively rich soils, so if your soil is sort of poor and sandy, or even if it's poor in clay, um, is you'll plant stuff and moss will spontaneously develop between the plants. So I have a lot of moss in my garden, especially where it's really dry actually, and in some of the woodland areas, um, but it's none of it's moss I planted, it just grows. And it's nice because I think it, it limits weeds a little bit, but there are also native plants that self sow onto moss well, um, better so than they do in other areas. So things like Midland Shooting Star seems to self sow well onto the moss. Um, maybe the wood betony to some degree. A lot of the smaller seeded earlier flowering plants, their seedlings seem to get going where it's mossy. And then one quick question, any recommendations for varieties of buffalo grass? Um, I'm using just the straight species. I'm not using anything improved. Um, so I really can't speak to that. I know that better for lawn varieties have been developed. The female flowers are kind of these spiky little balls, um, but they're not like sand burr spiky. Um, they're not going to injure your feet. Um, you can walk on them barefoot. I don't know. So a lot of the cultivated varieties are like all male. So they're just the little fuzzy eyelash male flowers and not female flowers. Um, mm -hmm. But I like having the mix. I like to have the, the buffalo grass doing its own um, sexual stuff in the lawn um, and maybe um, adapting over time or, you know, selecting over time for, for what does best in self-sowing. Mm -hmm. Then I have one last one and you can maybe get this one later too if it works better then. Uh, problems with ticks. I know that's a big issue in Wisconsin with Lyme disease. Um, so I I'm have a lot of that. opinions about ticks. I could talk about ticks for a long time. When we moved in, in spring 2014, there was a lot of buckthorn around the margins of our lot and I cleared it all out and I got a lot of deer ticks. Um, I encountered a lot of deer ticks. Um, and since then, we've had less and less lawn and more and more native stuff and there's tall herbaceous vegetation. Um, I think we've we've maybe picked up two or three deer ticks in all the years since in our lawn. Um, a lot of the problems, and this is based on my anecdotal experience, also some, some research has happened in different parts of the country, but the microclimate that really encourages deer ticks in particular, also the, the nymphs uh, or the earlier stages of lone star ticks, which are moving north, is um, is brush um, and 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 the way that brush creates a moist, relatively humid microclimate under the brush that protects the ticks when they're active from you know daily cycles of desiccation. The more of that they get, the shorter their lifespan and the less build up. Um, there are other factors that affect tick abundance, like mice and things like that too. But um, but you know, well-managed natural communities are dominated by taller vegetation too. A lot of those are burned, but the reason they have fewer ticks is because they don't have this brush layer that's creating this humid microclimate. And once you open that up, um, it just makes it harder for ticks to build up on the landscape. And I personally think that's one of the driving factors be behind um, increases in deer tick numbers. And Wisconsin deer ticks are really moving south uh, Lone Star ticks are moving north, so there are other factors that are that are at play there. But um, you know, we our our former oak cattle pastures, former oak savannas, former open woodlands have become you know over stories that are chucked up, choked underneath with brush, and brush is really the problem. Um, so 
If you want to keep an eye out for ticks or minimizing ticks, one thing to do is think about in, especially with deer ticks, they're active really September through um, April. Um, and in the winter, if there's not snow on the ground, but how much is the sun hitting the litter, leaf litter on the ground? How much is the sun hitting the ground? How much is the wind impacting the ground? The more that that's the case during that time of year, the harder it will be on ticks. Cool. All right. I think that's all the questions I've got for now, so I'll let you keep rolling. All right. Next slide. Um, so just some more pictures. So I, I had mentioned the prairie smoke before. If you have sandy soil, sand phlox is really nice. It's another really good early season plant. Um, next slide. This is the wood betony again. It's growing in with the Pennsylvania sedge. And that idea of filling space, but also filling time. So um, it might be hard for you to make it out in this picture, but there are some broader grass-like leaves. Those are nodding onions. Those will be later. There's going to be Ohio spiderwort there. There's showy goldenrod. There's sky blue aster. Um, so this is going to progress through the season. Uh, oh, and uh, yellow pimpernel, pimpernel uh, tinidia. Um, next slide. Uh, ruin enemies in one of my favorite really low ground covers. It's not the most foot traffic tolerant, but it's really good for a long paths and sidewalks. It's called grove sandwort. It likes well draining soils. Um, it tends to grow in oak woodlands um, and in dry forests, um, but it just forms this dense low mat. Um, and has these really tiny white flowers when it's in bloom and you can grow, you can just kind of stud it with other woodland and savanna wildflowers. Next slide. So this is one of those sedge areas just a little bit later on. So I, I showed you the, a fall image of this um, early on in the talk. And this is springtime and there's wild geranium coming into bloom. Robin's plantain in the middle is about to bloom. Um, Ragworts, this is round leaved rag, round leaved ragwort is about to bloom. Um, that's one that's in that table, woodland phlox. Um, so we have this matrix of sedges and we have some of those spreading wildflowers like the robin's plantain and the ragwort. And then, um, you know, there are things like woodland phlox and then and in the lower right, there's some golden alexanders and um, barely coming up in the bottom, there's some of that um, northern bed straw too, but then there's there's going to be other stuff intermixed with that. There's a whole bunch of nodding onion in this area too that'll come later. Next slide. A question, what's in the wire cage there? Stephanie just asked. Oh, oh, that is, uh, oh, where I'm thinking back in time. Um, that is uh, a uh, North American native shrub, native farther south, but grows well. Um, and I'm a collector of plants. It's Calicanthus floridus. Uh, it's an American spice bush. Is that the name, common name? But I'm just a little plant protecting it, and it helps me see that it's there, protect it from rabbits. Getting a little further on, wild geranium in full bloom. This is another area. I showed you an earlier spring image of this mostly sedges, but the wild geraniums really come up. There's woodland meadow rue in the front. There's starry false salmons plume to the left. On the left, a lot of the green stuff that's not blooming are later blooming asters. Um, and then, you know, this is an area where at the far left, there's a lot of shrubs and it's mulched and then there's the neighbors. So the light you see through there on the left is my neighbor's manicured lawn. Uh, next slide. Um, this area is near where a downspout comes out, and uh, there's a bunch of common fox sedge, Carex vulpinoidea. Um, it forms really nice clumps. They look kind of like prairie drop seed clumps. It's a really versatile sedge. It'll take average moisture to wet. And this is wild hyacinth, um, Camassia siloides. It's a great native bulb that blooms in late spring. And in the far background there, there's some Midland shooting stars. Um, so these are good. Those are both good um, bumblebee flowers too. Next slide. Uh, Virginia fire pink is a good one for a dry, well-drained, um, bright woodland sort of shade. Um, here it's right up under the birch tree. It's sort of growing in with that grove sandwort 
Um, the fuzzy stuff kind of right behind it is a bunch of that grove sandwort that I had mentioned earlier. Next slide. This is the Sprangles sedge grown a bit taller and that's prairie flocks. So this is kind of in part sun, enough sun for prairie flocks. Prairie flocks blooms just a little bit later than the woodland flocks. That's another great bumblebee plant. Um, I also see hummingbirds visiting that. Uh, next slide. So this is um, very similar to the image I had with the different colored dots earlier on, but it's just zoomed out. And this is just to give an idea of sequence. And just as an aside, one of my hobbies is growing um, um, North American plants of dry lands and dry prairies. So there are um, some great plains and um, central US species of cactus and that, that berm of sand and rocks. But, um, but anyway, next slide. You just sort of see how this progresses and gets taller and has different things blooming in different seasons. And the hammock's out in the middle of it. Um, so that hammock is strung out there and we go lay in there and by later in the year, and I don't think I should have gotten that picture in this talk, um, it's asters at the end of the year, a bunch of different asters blooming and you lay in there and it's like the asters are covered with all the bees and they're over you and you just watch them fly around. Um, that's fun to do with the kids. Next slide. Um, this is out front um, and we'll see a little bit of sequence here. There's a lot of prairie drops, even little blue stem stuff mixed in. There's a clump of sedge in the front center. That's Plains Oval Sedge, Carex brevior. That's a nice sedge for dry sun. Um, there's another similar good sedge for dry sun to part shade to also average moisture, um, Bicknell Sedge or Copper Shouldered Oval Sedge. Um, but Baptisias are starting to bloom. Um, there's common milkweed there. Don't plant common milkweed in the beginning. Wait till things are established. Um, common milkweed is good and it's a good monarch coast plant, but it will just take over if you plant it before things have filled in with good competitive native plants. Um, next slide. Um, so moving on along a little later after baptisias and, you know, things like spiderwort have, have flowered. So there's some, um, that's bracted spiderwort. It's a more, it, it's native where I am, but maybe not in Michigan. I'm not sure, but it, it blooms earlier in the summer and goes dormant. And then there's butterfly milkweed to bloom. Next slide. And I showed a picture, a slightly different time of year of this, this area earlier too, but then moving into summer, we're getting into things like pale purple cone flowers and sand coreopsis. Um, the baptisias are finishing up, the spiderworts, that's Ohio spiderworts finishing up. Um, the white spikes are prairie larkspur. It's eastern range limit is Wisconsin too. So I'm a, I'm a little west for that one. I mean, you're, you're a little west for that one. Next. And then as we get later, the tall stuff. So down along the road, there's a little bit of a swale. And I have sandy soils that are generally dry, but it gets enough runoff from the road. And the water table is probably two and a half feet deep there on average down at the bottom of that slope. So I can grow a wide variety of things. I can grow wetland plants and I can grow, grow um, sort of mesic prairie plants. So there's a compass plant on the left, there's rosin weed on the right, there's a prairie dock in the middle, different um, species of um, mountain mint. Um, there's a turtle head, Keloni glabra, right next to the compass plant, but a bunch of tall stuff. And early in the year, I showed you a picture earlier, there was a bunch of Canada anem anemone going along the road. Uh, well, this just all grows up through it, and you wouldn't even know it was there um, by later in the season. Uh, next slide. In sort of the at the woodland edge along our property line, moving into later summer, Great St. John's wort and Jill Pie weed. Next slide. This is a, a pathway along the house. There's some wild strawberry on the right. On the left, there's some tall stuff. Ooh. Some taller stuff up closer to the house. A meadow blazing star, um, Lytris ligula stylus. Um, native where I am, but if, if it's not native to Michigan, Lytris um, scariosa is pretty equivalent in terms of being just ridiculously attractive to monarchs. So if you want to have during monarch early migration, you know, 
five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten monarchs on one spike of Laetris, pick one of those two Laetris species. Um, there's cardinal flower and a lot of nodding onion. I really like nodding onion because you can stick it anywhere. It likes full sun, but it'll grow in a in a in the bright shade of um, oak or or birch. Um, so and it it'll, it'll just fit into any space. And it and and bees like it and flowers are pretty. Um, so you can eat it. Nothing not to like. Uh, next slide. A little later yet, lots of Joe Pye in the background in that woodland. Forked aster, which is a Midwest endemic. Um, some Solomon seal, which flowered earlier, but we just we just have that progression. This is um, an area that I again I showed you a picture of this earlier. It, was, it looked like it was all sedge, but it's not. All of this stuff has moved along. Uh, next slide. After the Joe Pye weed asters and, and goldenrods and a little bit of um 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 uh, oh, oh i'm just i'm just blanking because i normally walk and talk um but uh, oh the royal catch fly the red there um which is a has a really spotty and sparse distribution in the in the tall grass prairie uh next slide And then the grasses get really pretty. So the little blue stem does its thing. Um, next slide. And the grasses change color. So you have this sort of red orange little blue stem and this golden prairie drop seed and your kids can be out playing in it. Um, so this moves all the way through the season. Next slide. So now I'm gonna talk about maintenance a little bit briefly so this moving on from just how you establish this and how it might look but what does it actually take to take care of it um, so there are going to be some weeds especially early on next slide these are my favorite tools these make life easy so the tool on the left and hopefully they have these in stock if anybody wants to get them because sometimes they sell out but there's a wire weeder tool that johnny selected seed cells that's amazing and it's amazing for that period of time after you plant your transplants and all these little weeds are gonna, annual weeds are gonna germinate around those transplants. And that wire weeder is just, you just scrape all those off and you go through every couple of weeks and you scrape them all off. And the edge on that is just a little bit blunt. So you can be a little bit clumsy. And if you bump into your transplant, you don't cut it off, um, but, it's, but it's enough that if you're out there and you stay on top of weeds in the areas you've planted and you get them while they're just still really small, they just scrape right off and you just, it's like as fast as you could paint a wall, you're just going through and it's amazing how much ground you can cover. And then the flame weeder. So I just hook mine up to a regular propane tank like you'd have for a gas grill and schlep it around the yard. You can get a backpack harness. Um, but I use that along the property lines to keep neighbors' turf, turf grass from coming into the mulch and to keep that edge. That's the only place I keep an edge. Um, and I also use that if I've killed the turf and there's a flush of annual weeds before I plant, I melt them away with the flame weeder instead of spraying again. Because there's no reason to spray annual weed seedlings with herbicide. Um, you can kill them with heat and they're, they're gone forever. I also use that to kill the weeds in the cracks in my driveway. I don't spray those. Um, so those are my miracle tools, but you know, you're gonna bend over and pull weeds and there's some weeds with deep roots and it's good to have a tool to get those, but those are the most impactful tools in my view. Uh, next slide. So how much work is it? Well, once you've got it looking like this, it's really very little work. Um, you know, a lot of it is, I, I spend a lot of time just sort of walking around, looking at it, enjoying at it, being out there with my kids. If I see a weed, I pull it. And it's usually just, I see a weed, I pull it, and it's not a lot of work. Um, I do spend about, at this point, now that it's all done, 20 minutes a week doing sort of dedicated weeding, where I sort of go through a sector of the yard, and I make sure there are no weeds and I pull all the weeds and that's all the time it takes. And that's less time than my neighbors spend on their yards that they mow by a lot. But um, why it's very important to only bite off what you can chew when it comes to establishing stuff is that in order to get it to this point, 
you have to stay on top of the weeds during the period of time that it's establishing and filling in. Because if weeds become established during this time, that time, then it'll be a nightmare when you get to this point. Um, I also spend a lot of time sort of selecting things that are native. So I, I don't do a lot of weeding, but you know, I there are certain native plants that I keep in places that I want them. I move them around. They're, there are things I think might look weedy in a place to people, and so I, I modify it that way so I don't generate complaints. Um, but really, it's not a lot of work once it's established. The work all is in the planting and in the weeding for about the first um, year. Um, and the closer you space the transplants, maybe the first six months. Um, next. Yep, and so I think. Um, that is actually about it. And I think we'll probably have some more questions, um, maybe some, some more details or some more details on plants, but um, thank you very much um, for, for letting me talk about plants for a long time. And I'm happy to stay here and keep talking about plants and insects and frogs or whatever and kids playing outside. All right, thanks, Dan. Um... Yeah, I just have a bunch of folks saying thank you here. Uh, so if anyone has questions now, throw them in the chat and uh, and sounds like Dan's happy to stick around for a bit and answer them. Oh, so one question here, and you can probably see these now too. Where'd you get your flame weeder? Uh, you could get those lots of places. You could get them at a, probably a farm store or garden center maybe. Mine just came from Amazon. <laughs> Um, so they're they're really pretty widely available. There's all I don't know that the I can't rate or review one better than the other. I just have experience with the one I bought. Um, I've got a uh, the next question. Can you provide a list of your plants? <laughs> oh man! So you know how many North American plants are in this eight tenths of an acre? Uh, Five hundred twenty-five or so, <laughs> plus or minus. Um, it's a lot. Um, I do have a spreadsheet somewhere, um, but um, no, I, I would really focus on, you know, what are the elements of the communities, natural communities where you live, what species are there, and, or, or, um, or similar communities, maybe actually a little bit further south too. So I cast a wider net, especially a little farther south for climate change reasons. But um, but I would pay attention to those um, in your area and, and and try to hone in on those plants um, and, 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 and fit those together. Um, but you know, I'm still adding plants um, and there are things I've lost track of. I think, I don't know what the upward limit of is of plants that could fit into this space and coexist and 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 stuff but um uh, yeah so i guess yeah. i'm sort of um punting on that um, yeah it seems, it seems like the list for like an actual uh native lawn is pretty short um but beyond that yeah it's just kind of figuring out what works huh yeah yeah go to dry prairies or go to um woodlands or go to um you know um beach maple forests or whatever, you know, if you have a shady yard or sunny yard, if it's dry or whatever, try to figure out what natural communities are closest to that and go visit them and look at the plants. So what's the purple flower in this picture? That's the question I've got here. That is a uh, hoary vervain. And um, it's a prairie plant, likes it kind of dry. There's also a, 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 wet, a more wetland species, blue vervain. Um, so this is verbena stricta. Um, and it is, this is actually established from seed. So one of the things I didn't really get into is, um, you know, I established my transplants, it sort of fills in, but I keep throwing prairie seed in there. And while things are sort of establishing, I kind of try to fill that space even more um, and even more quickly by seeding in some quick establishing native species, but species that don't get huge and shade things out. So, um, I showed a picture of wasps on Plains Coreopsis. It has delicate foliage, doesn't take a lot of space, but I throw, it's an annual. I throw that out there. I throw hoary, hoary vervain in there. And if there are just some open spots, they tend to grow. 
um, I didn't plant transplants of that particular species. Go ahead. The next question is uh, related to Canada anemone. How afraid of it should we be? So Leslie asked uh, that. If you want it to be um, completely bounded by concrete or something, if if it doesn't, if it's not up against really dry, well-draining soils, because it really will spread. Um, where I have it down along the road, there's a lot of it, but the kind of the secret there too was um, plant other things just before you plant it so they get well-established. And if they're taller growing over the course of the season, they will grow up through it and it won't crowd them out. But if you plant them all at the same time, you'll just have Canada anemone and nothing else. Um, and if you don't want the Canada anemone to spread, if if um, if it's not dry in the surrounding area, it's going to spread into it. Uh, so Stacy's asked, did you have a, a go-to reference you use when you were just getting started? Oh, well, for me, a lot of this is sort of micro scale restoration ecology. So there's not really a garden book. Um, but, you know, my first reference was actually Stephen uh, well, Packard and Mutel's Prairie Restoration Handbook. Um, but that's seeding and that's uh, restoring and reconstructing prairies and savannas and woodlands. Um, so, you know, but a lot of a lot of this has just been my trying to take the principles that work there into where I have a lot more control and that's my home garden. Um, there is there are other people that garden this way with native plants that have um, books. Um, uh, ben Voigt, who is, uh, his last name is spelled V-O-G-T, um, who's in, in Nebraska. Um, oh, I don't know the name of his book, but it's, he does something very similar and it's, it's his day job. He's a landscape designer um, and um, uh, he, he's going to have a new bar, book coming out too, but he also has an online community about native gardening where you can talk about different methods and ways of preparing things and plants to grow. I think his site is called monarchgardens.com. If you Google Ben Voigt or Benjamin Voigt in Monarch Gardens, you'll find him. So he might be a good resource, but, but really I'm just, this is sort of my test lab. And it's also, so I'm a restoration ecologist and I'm out doing botanical assessments. I like having this as sort of a library too. So I'm I'm jamming things in there so I can know what things look like all times of the year. And so I know what this sedge looks like when it first comes up and all of that. Um, so you wouldn't necessarily do things differently if you were just, um, if you were gardening from, you know, whatever perspective you have as a different human being than me. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any suggestions where you can find pictures of uh, budding plants? That's a toughie. <laughs> no, people take pictures of flowers, not buds. Although you could try iNaturalist. Um, a lot of those will be flowers, but if you um, if you search by species on iNaturalist and you can filter images by when they were taken too, you could look for images and you can, I think you can filter, some of them are flagged as flowering, but some of the flowering ones aren't flagged, but you might find them in there. Um, so iNaturalist, they have an app too you can use to take pictures and help identify things. And I use it to help me catalog biodiversity. So if I find a rare plant or an invasive species, I use it to take a picture and geo reference where it was. But um, that app might work for that purpose. Yeah, Nicole suggests uh, landscaping with native plants in Michigan with Lynn Steiner. Uh, I know that I've got that book. It's a nice Nice to get other people's ideas once in a while. And she also had a question about suggestions for um, deer resistant wildflowers and other native plants. Oh, it depends on what deer. <laughs> um, there are very, um, uh, I've observed deer browse on, on most things. Um, the one shrub I've never observed deer browse on is leatherwood. Um, Durka, uh, but uh, oh, I don't know. Um, 
I have a lot of deer, deer browse my garden. There are some species, they, it's more of the species they really like. And so I just don't have so much of those. Like they really like um, prairie sink foil, um, Drymocallis arguda. They never let it flower. So I don't have a lot of that. Um, but really I'm going to try to grow anything. And if deer like it, then, then it won't be there anymore. Um, and if it's something really special to me, I might use that Bob X product. Um, uh, but other than that, uh, you know, deer are a potential threat to almost everything that's there. And once you get to a certain deer herd density, it's only the most repulsive plants that they're not going to eat. So I mentioned that, you know, there are places near me where buckthorn can't grow. Um, uh, then you're really in a bind and you, <laughs> you're really not going to fix that problem with what you grow in your landscape. It's going to take, um, that's like a public policy issue that needs to, to change. Mm -hmm. yeah, a couple of folks in the comments mentioned uh, more of the scented things like wild onions, uh, mints I know tend to do a little bit and then wild geranium and wild ginger. So. Yeah, if I think about it, I haven't, so, I have had them eat the buds off my nodding onions, and I have had them eat the onions in my garden, but generally they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. So it depends. Um, I don't think that, yeah, hairy stuff, and yeah, but generally I think that's good ad advice. Wild geranium, I think I do get some browse, especially when it first comes up, uh, but later on I don't. Um, mm -hmm. But now I just have so much wild geranium, if they browse some of it, it doesn't really matter. Oh, Jane remembered the book, uh, Ben Voigt's book, uh, a new garden ethic. Is that the one you were thinking of? That that sounds right. So that's the book he has. He has another book that he's working on that I um, gave him a couple of images for that he will have subsequent to that. So um, so he has a book and he will have another book maybe in a year or so, I would guess. Mm -hmm. And it looks like someone mentioned their swamp milkweed doesn't get eaten very much. Katie, I hope you're, I'm pronouncing your name correctly. <laughs> I, I want to say something about milkweeds. So um, there are tons of milkweeds you can grow. Um, and I mentioned it's good to plant common milkweed after you've got everything established or it can be really aggressive. But, um, you know, people say monarch butterflies don't like the orange or butterfly milkweed as much. But I have... I think nine species of milkweed and I get caterpillars on that one too. Um, if you have really dry sandy areas, you can grow world milkweed or short green milkweed and, and those are both available. Swamp milkweed is a great one if it's not too dry. Um, sort of a little less moist but not dry. There's a milkweed called prairie milkweed. I don't know if that gets into Michigan though, but that's a really beautiful milkweed that you can grow. Um, Purple milkweed is is great. Um, so there are a lot, you can dabble in milkweeds. You can become sort of a milkweed aficionado. All right, I'm not seeing any more questions. If anyone else has questions, here's the last call. Oh, Jane Manson mentioned Sullivan's milkweed. Yep. Nice one. Um, yeah, that's what I meant. When I, prairie milkweed is another name for that. Yep, yep. That's, Beautiful. Cool. Well, everyone's uh, throwing a lot of thanks in the chat box, Dan, and I want to echo their thoughts. Great to have you on tonight, and uh, thanks for sharing your wealth of knowledge. Um, yes, yeah, super inspirational. I know a lot of your uh, your yard is uh, an inspiration for mine, and I'm sure a lot of other folks now too. So thanks again for coming on tonight. This was uh, lots of fun. Yeah, thanks so much. And thanks everyone for, for coming and, and chatting. And it was fun.